Bobby. Yes. One of my favourite movies of yours, one of my favourite movies of all time, Call It Carol. Oh, Call It Carol, yeah. It's a fantastic film. Yeah, I think 1970, Pete Walker. Yeah. I just, um, I'd been in If, and um, I worked Pasolini, Zeph Reddy, a few other people, and Pete Walker was sort of nosing around for someone to play this this part. Joe Sickle was the character. That's it. And um, I've had to do a bit of homework about tonight as well. <laughs> <laughs> I had to find out who the other was. And, um, and uh, he, he saw me, or he auditioned me, and uh, he just gave me the part straight away. And I was very, very, very excited because uh, things were changing then, 68, 69. Um, uh, the, the little films like The Graduate, Midnight Cowboy, um, th 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 there was a sort of more although my career changed later, there was a more realistic approach to, to acting on, on screen and, and it gave me the chance to play a character um, who, who was lost in a big city and come up from the country. Well then I did four dimensions of Greta, or with three dimensions as it started, but then the budget got bigger and there were four, four, four dimensions, four, yeah. in which I had to shag Lena Scoob in, in 3D, yeah. which was quite interesting. And I remember going to see that film with a, a great actor called Richard Warwick, I don't know if you remember Richard Warwick, who's sadly not with us anymore, who, who was an if, played Wallace in if. Uh, and he said, oh darling, he said, look, look, he said, the classic cinema in, in Piccadilly Circus, he said, darling, look, it's my, look, three dimensions, great, there's your ass. he said, let's, let's, let's go in and watch this, and we've gone in, and uh, it was, they had 3D, and it was the early days of 3D, and I uh, went in and sat there, and um, the, 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 so now you have to put the glasses on, and as you put the glasses on, I then mount Lena Skoog, <laughs> And give her a jolly good scene to it. And uh, it's quite extraordinary. The audience swaying backwards and forwards with her tits, you know. And that was that was early 3D. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> the films that you, you enjoy making. Um, I mean, what, what a start to to go. F I was at Bristol University, and I was in a play. I, Lindsay Anderson had seen me in a play, um, R Richard III. Um, and it's the, where the gag comes from. Robin Asquith played Richard the Third, and Richard the Third lost um, <laughs> because <laughs> because uh, it was my. F I'm sure you know this. Story, my first um, ad lib was uh, in uh, the production of Richard Third, in which I was playing Richard the Third, and I was a huge fan of uh, Laurence Olivier and all the pathetic nose and the, this. And under the lights, like in Peter Sellers' um, <laughs> film, the nerves, you know, it started to melt, and it sort of edges dropped off. And I turned to the audience and went, a nose, a nose, my kingdom for a nose. <laughs> and I was told I would never, ever, ever again appear in a, in a university production. But Lindsay Anderson was there, and it's like a fairy tale beginning, said, you know, come on, we're, we're casting a film called The Crusaders, which is what it was called at the time. And so... Um, it was a dream start to be, although a small part I ended up in the film, to be on the whole shoot for eight weeks, to be introduced to the magic of, 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 of filmmaking. I, obviously with Lindsay Anderson such a high level, uh, to see how, what the cameras do, uh, what, 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 a, uh, what an assistant does, what a sound guy does. It was like, it was like, a, it was like I've never learned anything like that at university. It was a huge training ground. And, and so that remains as an experience of one of my favourite films. Um, there's, and I've done so many different types of films, like the, the independent films, the, the, the confession films. It's very, very difficult to pinpoint um, one film as, as your favourite. Something like Britannia Hospital at the time was considered a pretty crappy film. Uh, and it, it was considered a crappy film mainly because uh, we invaded the Falklands and it was it, it was seen as maybe overcritical of, of a decaying, corrupt political um, system using the hospital as a metaphor, uh, and therefore was virtually ignored. I think it's been rediscovered that film. I think that <coughs> that was that was great fun to do, oh. and uh, to shoot and to to live in a lunatic asylum, <laughs> which I'm sure many of us <laughs> here have done uh, involuntarily. So maybe and. Um, uh, to work in a lunatic <laughs> for eight weeks with Leonard Rossiter was, uh, <laughs> was an interesting experience. Especially when, what? oh yeah, once we were filming 
And uh, because Coney Hatch Lane was still a lunatic asylum while we were filming it, it was an operating <laughs> lunatic asylum. So you had actors and you had lunatics. <laughs> and I know what you're thinking. And uh, so you'd queue up for your food every day, which is half the reason an actor does a film in any case, free food. And, and then Rosita and I are queuing up for food. And this woman actually said to Leonard Rosita, uh, he said, uh, he said, I'm, so, I'm terribly sorry, th th this, this food is for actors, not the lunatic. And Leonard Rosco was not too pleased. <laughs> I, I've always heard he was quite a perfectionist. Did you hey, Yeah, that? well, it's one, another one of those people you're told it's going to be very, very difficult, and I, I found him absolutely fantastic to work, to work with. A perfectionist. Most, most, uh, most people are mm. perfectionists. Um, and um, somebody like, especially with humour, you know, a lot of pain in the arses as well. But yeah, but for me, he wasn't. Right. He was a gentleman. Oh, and the funny story about Leonard Roster is is um, <laughs> is uh, no, uh, Joan Plowright one day said, she said, oh, she said, she said, you and Leonard, you're always going off playing squash, having fun. She said, why don't you, you know, you never involve me with all the, the stuff that's going on. I said, well, Joan, you know, you're dame, whatever you are. I said, you know, we just keep out your way a bit, really. And she said, to, well, well, I'll do anything, I'll do anything. I said, all right. And we were walking past Leonard Rossiter's dressing room uh, at what is now, whatever it was, um, whatever studio it is in Wembley. And um, uh, I said, go in there. I said, look, there's a pair of his wife runs, um, Dame Olivia. Go in there and sniff his wife runs uh, and, and wave them at me. Oh, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. <laughs> so, so in she goes, picks up the underwear, goes, <laughs> not noticing that Leonard had just come out of the bathroom. <laughs> and all he can see is Dame <laughs> waving it and going, <laughs> oh, bloody hell, and throw them out. And they, they never spoke again. But, um, so Nicholas Alexandra was a tiny little part in that, but I was put in a hotel in the Madrid Hilton and I sat there for two weeks because I had to do the scene when I run through the uh, sunflower seeds with this girl um, and um, the sunflowers were, <laughs> were facing the wrong direction. <laughs> they were sort of not got there to be at that angle. That's how mad it was. So I'm sitting in a ho the, 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 the Madrid Hilton for weeks on end waiting for these sunflowers to go around on full money and, and I met Oliver Reed um, <laughs> one night, who was not even in the film, <laughs> in the bar, who just happened to be there. He, sort of, he took a bit of liking to me, and we're having a drink, and he went, watch this. He went, he went watch this. And we're in the Hilton Bar in Madrid, and I'm like 18, and he watched this, and there was a huge fish tank behind the, the bar. Uh, he's gone round, got into the fish tank, <laughs> and he's swimming, <laughs> pissed out of his head, in his fish tank, grabbing fish, and there's, and there's people like standing at the bar going, <laughs> That's all of the ring. Pasolini, I'd, I'd worked with Franco Zeffirelli, and we hadn't really seen eye to eye, um, and um, eventually I was, um, I, I got this call from, I mean, I tell the story that it was Pasolini, but it wasn't. It was an assistant to Pasolini who phoned me when I got back to London and said, uh, "We hear you are Zeffirelli enemy. Uh, would you come to meet Pasolini?" So I went and met him rather bizarrely in a suite at the Hyde Park Hotel, which was a strange place for one of Italy's leading communi communistic poets. But anyway, there he was in the suite. And uh, I don't know, we sort of fell in love at first sight. And his first words to me through an interpreter were, you look like you use your cock a lot. And I thought, oh, God, here we go. <laughs> so I took my member out and said, does it look like it? <laughs> and he laughed like a drain. <laughs> and we became firm friends until the day, sadly, he, he, he left this world. And um, t t he, he was an absolute joy. And I have letters from Pasolini, and there's uh, somebody I read, I don't know if it's um, someone like Melvin Bragg or somebody collects the letters of Pasolini. I actually have a couple that I've kept from him. And uh, working with him was an extraordinary experience. But the thing about Pasolini was he, he, um, he really, 
to, to arrive on a to arrive on a Zeffirelli set, you're aware of being on a Zeffirelli set, and it's all uh, to me up someone's ass. Uh, on Pasolini's set, you're aware of being in a, a community, and you. I was greeted by Franco Chitti, who's a you know a, was a pretty prolific Italian actor, and I thought, oh, oh well, what was he doing here? And he was my dresser. You know, he was mm -hmm. he was handing me the costumes and and saying, "Is everything all right?" And uh, he was a very nice. And Ninetto Davioli, and one of the actors was was busily what, putting a bit of hay around the set. Um, he created uh, a fantastic working a a a atmosphere. And um, whether you believe in in his way of shooting films is it, just a question of personal preference. I personally uh, uh, found it very very exciting. Uh, Particularly, and I think you're angling me towards the story of the urinating over a crowd of people in Essex, um, where I had to do this huge Chaucerian speech and urinate over a crowd of people. The only thing was, he hadn't told the people <laughs> who, who were local vi villagers from Chipping Camden, where they were from, um, they, they were instructed, as you are now, to sit where you are. And, uh, and they're all excited villagers being in a film. Um, and uh, the, an actor's going to come out <coughs> and he's going to give you some Chaucerian stuff. You're all just whoa, whoa, heckling, whatever, this, that, and the other. Ha not having told them that I was going to piss all over them. Uh, I had assumed, that, and I'd been told, yes, don't worry, they've all been told. And I was full of cider, so I could <laughs> perform. And I was with what was supposed to be a prostitute having sex with. Them. Well, if you see the film, you see it. And. Um, I've got myself ready with a cider to urinate, woof, and I'm, and it's difficult enough to remember the bloody Chaucerian, never mind <laughs> pissing, I'm pi and I can see these people, obviously not going to be pleased in any case, but they weren't right, really not pleased, you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> it wasn't, oh my god, he's pissing over me, yeah. it was, <laughs> <laughs> and it's not a good thing to do, open your mouth like that. <laughs> Someone's pissing over. I think Confessions of a Window Cleaner is, 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 is a proper film. When I eventually took the part, and, and there's a fairly well documented story about um, me turning it down and everybody else turning it down, and then they were very keen on me doing it and they got me back in. It was originally uh, an independent film. Columbia came on board. So they are invited, and they said, but you've got no one to play Timmy Lee, you, you know, who have you got? And they had this list, and Dennis Waterman, Richard Sullivan, um, Richard Beckinsale, uh, and me, and everyone was sort of a bit wary of this sort of constant sort of shagging, and, and you know, what was it really all about? Uh, and then the script got changed, um, and then I got called in one more time, and um, they said, you know, what is the problem? And I said, well, I just, sh I, I was 23. I, I said, I just feel it should be more humorous. They said, give me an, give us an idea. I said, well, when he's shagging that girl on the floor, maybe some bubbles are flying out of his ass. <laughs> and uh, you regretted saying that, didn't you? <laughs> well, I did as it happened. But, but, but as it, I really regret as it happened. But, but and they sort of were sort of quite miffed. <laughs> and I, as I left, um, apparently what happened was. Tom Nicholas had said, any luck with the casting? And they said, yeah, well, the guy we really want to in Asquith, but unfortunately, he's slightly mental and, <laughs> and, and wants bubbles flying out of his arse <laughs> when he's shagging the girl in the kitchen floor. And the guy said, whatever he wants, give it to him. He's the guy. <laughs> <laughs> the thing was, an if I took my clothes off in Pasolini, I'd say, you know, it was, it was, um, <coughs> it, it never really worried me at all. And on a serious note, it was a bit odd for me uh, because as a kid I had polio and was 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 told first that you'll never walk again. And there's a great scene in that uh, Ian Drury um, uh, biographical film. I think it's called It's Only Rock and Roll, isn't it? Uh, where where the, there's a the whole polio sequence and it's just so accurate about uh, and you just heard it into these these homes and told you've got just got to celebrate your crippledom. And I and that was so so all I, I you know I had no thought that one day I would actually get my body back into, con I was very, very lucky, to, to, into sort of a condition uh, where I would be running around naked and, and it was all right, you know.
it, I, I wasn't, so, so in other words, I was quite pleased <laughs> that I could display my body, and it wasn't as I was told it would be. I was very, very lucky. Did you have fun doing Queen's Oh, but what? Well, I was just surrounded by girls again. You know, it's really odd. It was one of those ideas that sounded good. I uh, went to meet the guy, Frank Agrama, who, who um, produced and directed it, um, who, who really gave a great pitch for the story. It's about uh, an 80-foot female gorilla with enormous tits. <laughs> and I thought, well, I've shagged most things on films, I'll have a go at that. <laughs> and... Um, uh, it, uh, it, and, and the story really sounded. I thought this is this is quite funny. This I'm great. Pay. Oh yeah. And then of course you realise as you get into the filming that it's a ten minute joke, if that spread over hours. And and it was, you know, it, it had this extraordinary budget. And there's a scene that's not in the film which, which I really wish they'd kept. Which is, she had she, Queen Kong has this um, fantasy sequence of becoming my size and falling in love with me and there's an actual tap dancing <laughs> <laughs> I tap danced with a, with a monkey they run out of money so the special effects the, you know the, the big day when the gates open and and Queen Kong was coming out and was uh, I remember Bill Butt Richardson and Kirkland BBRK who were the special effects company that actually were involved with Ridley Scott that bought, bought Shepperton in the end um, not on the strength of this, um, <laughs> came up to me and said, R I said, well, I'm really looking forward to this. I said, the 80-foot monkey, they said, well, don't get too excited. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's it.